have to say that seeing the world through Barbara's eyes is an amazing view. <laughs> These are all the hairstyles that I can never wear. <laughs> oh, to my hair. My disappointment with my hair started at a very young age. As far back as I can remember, I had pigtails tied in rubber bands and ribbons. In school, the pigtails would come undone, and my teacher would have to redo them. That's how thick they were. As I got older, my mother took me to a nifty department store in Manhattan called Bloomingdale's. The hairdresser wrapped me in a long pink cape. My hair was washed, dried, and curled with a curling iron. I felt special, really, really special. I felt pretty. I felt as if I was loved. I was no longer plain barber with olive skin and glasses. My aunt referred to me, this is Yiddish, for grint and for gilt. In English, that means you look green. <laughs> um, <laughs> while returning home on the subway train, something happened. My curls started to go limp. As they let go of my scalp, they unfurled like little flags on my forehead and around my face. How could this be, I thought. It felt pretty enough for my mother to love me. Now my hair was betraying me. How could this be? I began to obsess about long, beautiful hair, the kind that Hope had. My mother and I decided I needed a perm. In the 50s, the perms were more like something from the Middle Ages. <laughs> Back in Bloomies, I sat under a huge Victorian silver dome with worm-like rods dripping menacingly from it. 30 minutes, I emerged, frazzled, overbaked, sizzling, sizzling, and smelling like rotten eggs. <laughs> Riding home on the train, I drip sweat as people around me change seats. <laughs> <laughs> Why, you ask? That's because I smelled like sulfur. In high school, while all the girls had long, flowing hair or hair tied in a ponytail, I wore scarves tightly around my head and around my neck. I looked as if I was going to a hanging. The other girls <laughs> behave yourself. <laughs> the other girls in my classes had page boys, ponytails, and long flowing hair. I looked like I was from another planet. On a cruise to Hawaii as a married woman, I decided to wear a turban. I didn't care if I looked like an Arab. It was good enough for Carmen Miranda. Minus the fruit. It was good enough for me. From the stares that I received, I think the other passengers on the boat thought I had some kind of brain tumor. <laughs> oh, how I long for long flowing hair, the kind that makes chignons, page boys, upsweeps, ponytails, and a long braid. Which brings me to today. My hair is now thinning out. I don't think I'll have to worry much more about hair. <laughs> Soon I'll be able to remove my teeth. <laughs> You're just funny. Get new knees and new hips. So much to look forward to. I can't wait to stop thinking of long flowing hair and start thinking about body replacements and facelifts and skin peels. <laughs> Now this is what a spy purse looks like, and you can see that the flap, which was left over there, no longer exists, but there was a flap over here. Okay. I first spotted the purse at the weekend fair in Palm Desert. Oh, thank you very much. These are my prop people. Thank you. This is the spy purse flap. I loved looking and exploring, and it wasn't easy to find the stall because I didn't know that it belonged to Gloria, a lovely young Spanish woman and her husband. Both were very proud that they were selling copies of expensive designer purses, beautifully copied at $65, a real bargain, so I thought. The sales girl was quick to sidle up to me and say, 
in Italy, this purse goes for $1,500. What woman wouldn't jump at that offer? So now I have my very own, nobody will know the difference, beautiful black purse. It's called a spy purse. That's because it has so many compartments. You could hide anything from keys, a cell phone, to a small radio, and, and even a nuclear secret, I promise you that. And if someone stole it, they wouldn't know where the goods are. Best of all, it only cost me $65. I was a smart shopper, I told myself. The purse is so jammed with hidden pockets and compartments, I went to the local police station with such a unique piece of equipment, I volunteered to work as an undercover agent. <laughs> I was rejected. I might have a crime-preventing weapon on my arm, but due to a variety of physical ailments, like I can't bend well, my knees don't raise up, my arm doesn't go over my head, the police wasted no time in telling me I would be useless. <laughs> they also asked me to leave my spy purse with them. Immediately following the debacle with the police, I returned home. The flap of my purse fell off. Early the following weekend, I was back with Gloria's knockoff purses. Gloria wasn't there. I wondered whether she had been arrested for selling knockoffs. <laughs> Her husband politely thanked me for bringing the purse back and quickly put in a larger pen to secure the flap. He admitted the old pen was defective and guarantee that this flap would never fly off. A few nights later, I went out to dinner with some friends. Guess what? While casually opening the purse, it fell off onto the lap of a nearby diner. <laughs> she had immediately dropped her spoon in the soup, which splashed some of the greasy liquid on her blouse and her face. I slunk into my chair and quickly put the spy flap in the purse. I briefly thought about retrieving the flying pen from the woman's soup bowl. I now knew for sure that I would never work for the government as an undercover agent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>